brother, brother, there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. War is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Pick it lights and pick it sides. Don't punish me with brutality. Talk to me. So you can see Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's special program, a 2020 cultural postmortem. Uh, my name is Max Orr. I'm the executive director for Carolina Public Humanities, and I'm joining you from sunny Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, today, we're very excited to be uh, collaborating with colleagues uh, from two fine public institutions, the University of Colorado Boulder, CU Boulder, and the University of Iowa. And here's a shout out to all those folks joining us from or through Iowa City, Iowa City and Boulder. Hello, everybody. And this project started on the initiative of our dear friend and former colleague here uh, at UNC, Jennifer Ho. Dr. Ho is now professor of ethnic studies at CU Boulder and the director of that institution's Center for the Humanities and the Arts, one of our partners today. And one gratifying change that uh, uh, we were aware of, Jennifer and I worked together here at UNC, was to see this uh, over the past decades with increasing network and collaborations between humanities centers and programs at universities and colleges nationwide. And another one of those great institutions is the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies at the University of Iowa, our other partner institution to, to, uh, today, and uh, whose director, Dr. Teresa Mangum, is also a professor of gender, women's, and sexuality studies and English. And uh, you can find links to both these centers and to Carolina Public Humanities in the chat box. So we uh, had a few talks uh, last year as well as this year thinking about some way that these three institutions could collaborate to address the quite remarkable times we were living in. We wanted to do something different than sort of a purely political and social review of the year we just witnessed. Uh, with the humanities focus on 2020, we really hope to better understand uh, the year through things like an analysis of the particular struggles of underrepresented peoples, uh, a review of some of the new media that we saw and its impact on society and culture. We want to cast some light on perhaps some international perspectives of the year's events, and we can cover these and many more topics with humanities focus because the humanities cover everything. Uh, before we begin, I have a lot of people to thank, and I'll do this quickly. We need to thank people from many institutions for their efforts in making this possible. From the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, I want to thank our colleagues at Carolina Public Humanities, Paul Bonici, who is working on technology right now with us, Brian Ensminger and Vicki Breeden, and all the staff at Carolina Public Humanities. From the University of Iowa, we want to have a particular shout out to Jennifer New, Jenna Hamerick, Eric Hackathorn and Aaron Klein, in particular to Aaron, who has helped us set up this webinar ticket. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you everyone out there in Iowa. And from lovely Boulder, Sharon Van Boven, Kat Lewis, and Danny Urbina. So thank you all. It takes a village, it takes a whole village to raise a, a webinar. 
One quick reminder for everyone, uh, during this talk, you can submit questions during the webinar on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we may not be able to get to it, all of them, but we'll do our best, and we do want to know what interests you. 2020 was a year unlike any I've lived through, and yet much of it was depressingly familiar. To guide us through this, I'm honored to introduce our moderator for tonight's discussion, who will in turn introduce our panelists. Please welcome our dear friend from high in the mountains, Dr. Jennifer Ho. Thank you, Max. It's really lovely to be introduced by you. Um, and, you know, big shout out to my friends at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I'm thrilled to be partnering with the Overman Center and Carolina Public Humanities. And it's really my pleasure to introduce all of our panelists. So if I can ask them all to um, come on now, I'm going to introduce each person in the order in which they will be sharing brief remarks about their own cultural analysis, artistic analysis, humanist analysis of the year 2020. Um, and then I think we're all in for a real tweet as we get to listen to our panelists have a really rich conversation about all of these things. There are a few common questions that we've come up with. We also hope that you will use the Q&A webinar function and pose your own questions. Um, so, I'm going to introduce everyone and then we will have the first person start out. So it's my deep pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Melinda Maynard Lowry, um, who is an award winning US Indigenous historian and filmmaker at UNC Chapel Hill, where she also directs the Center for the Study of the American South. Her second book, The Lumbee Indians and American Struggle, was published with UNC Press in 2018, and her public intellectual work can be found in Oxford American, Scalawag, and the New York Times, among other places. Her documentary films have been screened on HBO and premiered at the Sundance Festival. And I believe there's going to be a link to her webpage so you can read more about her in depth. Um, we're doing very brief intros because if I were to do the full scope of intros for our distinguished panel, it would take probably at least half an hour. So the next person I'd like to introduce um, you to is Ruth Ellen Coker. Um, Ruth Ellen Coker is an award-winning poet who has authored six poetry collections most recently she published Third Voice with Tupelo Press in 2016. Her poems have been translated into Persian and included in notable anthologies such as Angels of Ascent, a Norton anthology of contemporary African-American poets. In addition to her creative work, Ruth Ellen is the Associate Dean of Special Initiatives and a professor of creative writing in the English department at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and our final panelist is Christopher Merrill, who is an award-winning poet. By the way, notice that I keep using the phrase award-winning because that is how distinguished our panelists are. Um, an award-winning poet and writer who has published six poetry collections, six works of nonfiction, and many edited volumes and volumes of translations. A new book of prose poems, Flares, is forthcoming from White Wine Press. He directs the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa, where he also holds an appointment as professor of English. So please, um, a very warm round of applause wherever you're watching from. Um, and Melinda, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm really thrilled to be able to speak about a couple of my most compelling to me anyway, interests. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that I want to never forget about 2020 is the um, opportunities that we've had. Um, not every single one of us has had a shared sense of opportunity and that phrase, we're all in this together has come to mean deeply um, divisive things, I think, in our nation, in contrast to its kind of unifying rally cry. Um, when this, when the pandemic first struck us in the spring, um, it took many people, me included, of course, aback. And it radically changed some of our work lives and it didn't change at all um, the work lives of many others, essential workers who continued to be essential even after that moniker kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and we talked less and less about them. Their work and their lives became more and more entrenched in different ways with our own. So the idea of um, being in it together, I hope has uh, begun to require a new kind of resonance from the way we started hearing that phrase back at the, at the, in the spring, and at least it was spring here in 
in North Carolina, um, spring of 2020. The sort of twist on that phrase that I heard throughout as our universities were, re were trying to figure out what to do in the fall uh, was that we are uh, in the same ocean or the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And so that sort of metaphor, I think, has continued to ring true as COVID in particular has, has uh, kind of evolved and as we face a new, seemingly new picture of it every single day almost um, in the United States. The, I think the metaphor that came to came to be in December 2020 and then in December sorry in January 2021 it didn't feel like 2020 ended for me anyway until maybe it's ending now I don't know but <laughs> but the sense in which um we moved from you know in it together in the same boat together to being in the same storm but in different boats it feels like now we are in a position of um you know, rocky shoals, basically. Um, I think the the metaphors and the inspiration that we draw for this deep uncertainty that lies ahead of us are going to be perhaps um, more fragmented than ever. I mean, that's one that's one word to use. In the humanities, we are we are greatly blessed with a richness of words and meanings to ascribe as we move through our human experiences. And the, um, the, the, no, the word fragmented comes to mind as I'm thinking about the very, the new ways in which all of our boats have kind of acquired different sorts of characters, um, characteristics. So some of those are um, political as we seek to understand the divides that face us. Some of those characteristics are um, intensely local some of them are, as they are local, they are also intensely urban or rural or suburban or even other categories that we, categories of place that we don't talk, talk about typically. Um, and the, you know, the, the part of human experience that brings this fragmentation to me is the grief that I think we are all sharing. And so in 2020, um, are we, what truly unifies us if, you know, if I could name something, it would be, I think, grief. And um, we've lost colleagues at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, people like Randall Keenan and Jenny Tonpahot. Um, we have lost over 400,000 Americans in a pandemic that was entirely preventable um, the effects of which were entirely preventable. We um, have yet to really understand what that grief means, but I hope moving into 2021, we are all able to think deeply about that that we share, at least the grief that we share. So, thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Ruth Ellen. Um, from really hanging on what you just said, Melinda, when you said grief unifies us, it's kind of a riveting thing to say, um, especially given uh, part of my retrospect for this last year has much to do about the way we found within a pandemic when we were all separated and sheltering um, alternative ways to unify and have unity. Um, one of the discoveries that I made last year, um, much to my surprise, was that there was this little app uh, on my phone called TikTok. And when I, I turned it on, sometimes I saw teenagers dancing. Sometimes I saw um, guys skateboarding with ocean spray. But very often I saw Black Lives Matter protest. I saw protest surveillance so that people were taking video of protesters to protect them when they'd gotten picked up by the police. 
I saw ally surveillance of uh, white allies actually filming police in the arrest of black and brown bodies. Uh, it was an interesting serendipitous mechanism, a teenager's app that became kind of foundational in the, the whole political movement that we saw happen through 2020, right down to the um, sabotage, I don't know what else to call it, of a number of the Trump rallies, right? Uh, the organization happened in real time, I watched it. Um, I watched uh, creators on this app identify white supremacists and create these communities that essentially represent everything we do in the arts and humanities. They're using music, they're using video, um, they're creating communities with hashtags and then intersecting and creating new things which some of us call transdisciplinary, right? Which is what we're trying to get our institutions to embrace. And the interesting thing about it is 69% of the users on this app are 13 to 24, right? And you think they'd mostly just be interested in doing the renegade, uh, but they were interested in a lot of other things. And I, I wanted to share some of these statistics for hashtags because it might surprise you. And this is, I'm thinking last year I was divisional dean. So all of the departments in the arts and humanities were under me. So I'm thinking of my departments, right? So the hashtag dance has two, remember some of us are fighting against the old adage that the arts and humanities are a luxury and they're not necessary. The hashtag dance had 257 billion views. Hashtag history, 7.7 .7 billion views. Poetry, 19.2 billion. Philosophy, even philosophy got in on this game with uh, not so shabby 285.6 million views. Even the arts and humanities, humanities 6.2 million, arts 988.5 million. The most granular that I got was Hawthorne. Even Hawthorne got $4.5 million views. Uh, did I say million dollar? Yeah, <laughs> million dollar views. But all of this is happening at the same time that we have the arts and humanities intersecting with this kind of mobile digital uh, tool that becomes free media as people are having trouble trusting their media. Um, there's a former White House correspondent named Marcus DiPaolo, and he's now a famous kind of freelance TikTok reporter who I just watched before I came on this broadcast because he was reporting on Biden's uh, Carrie's uh, characterization Q&A session with the press on Biden's um, emergency climate plan, which I won't see on MSNBC for a couple more hours, right? Um, it's just amazing for me to see the way that we've been able to connect virtually by means of the arts and humanities um, in this app. And um, I think that the intersection between these communities is the most interesting thing to me. And the visibility that it's given many of us who don't have that same um, visibility in our primary communities, right? Um, I, there's, a, uh, there's a woman in Utah named Lex Scott, who is, um, she is the founder of Black Lives Matter Utah. She's a civil rights attorney. Um, in real time, I learned this morning that the uh, bill that uh, they've proposed in Utah for police reform has sailed through the house. I don't know if I'll even hear that um, or read that in my news stream today or tomorrow. So that has been the fascinating, um, the fascinating characteristic of this last year for me that has been like none other, um, that in some ways 
isolation necessitated new genius that leads back to the things that we've always done very naturally. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Chris. Uh, those are two tough acts to follow. Uh, I want to thank you for including me in this uh, really exciting conversation. The things that I've been thinking about, and I just want to pick up on uh, what Ruth Ellen was saying with respect to TikTok, is that uh, right after 9-11, the, the, one of the most uh, visible things on the internet were the people trading poems, particularly W.H. Uh, Auden's September 1st, 1939, because it felt like that same kind of moment. And then I'm, I was thinking in, in the, during the Arab Spring in 2011, I was traveling a great deal in, in the Middle East, and that's when I started following uh, Twitter, because it, it, for one thing, I could figure out where I needed to be uh, for safety's sake, but, but also for uh, journalistic uh, reasons where things were happening. And now, of course, we've come to uh, 2020 and 2021 and TikTok uh, has changed everything for, for us. I have to say, I came to TikTok through Sarah Cooper, which uh, was one of the great uh, in, ingenious uh, discoveries, I think, of the, of the last year. I also want to pick up on what Melinda was saying in terms of grief. Um, for me, uh, what 2020 has meant is that for 30 years, I was uh, traveling internationally almost every month uh, or sometimes staying abroad for quite long periods. And this is the longest that I've been in the States uh, it, since uh, about 1990. And that's a very strange feeling that, and part of what's been going on in that time is not just uh, registering all the, the, the catastrophic losses we are, uh, we see as a, as a society, but um, registering them in my own life. Uh, I finished a book with uh, my, my dear friend, the, the poet Marvin Bell, and I started a project together about 10 years ago, writing prose poems back and forth. And we finished our second volume uh, just at the start of the pandemic. And we thought, well, let's write a third volume and we'll try to document in whatever way we can uh, what we see going on around us. And for the first time in the 10 years of this uh, collaboration, we were both in the same city, though, of course, we couldn't see each other. Uh, and, and one of the interesting tensions in the books that we wrote before was that Marvin was in the States and I was abroad. Now, of course, uh, we're in the same place. And when Marvin passed away in December, uh, we had fallen about 60 uh, paragraphs short of uh, finishing a book. I, I thought, my God, this has really been the worst possible year of any. It began for me with my mother passing away and it's ended with, uh, with Marvin's death. And as a writer, what I have done through this whole period is to try to write about it, to try to uh, make some kind of sense out of uh, where we are and what I've experienced. And thank God for uh, Zoom. Last night, I got to watch uh, Natasha Trezaway and Joy Harjo uh, give a reading in, at Arizona State University and have a conversation afterwards, uh, moderated by Natalie Diaz, three of my favorite poets in the world. And they were right in my home office, uh, about three feet away. And uh, uh, that's the kind of thing that's gone on over this past year that's uh, one of the, I guess, one of the hopeful signs. And as we move eventually to the end of a pandemic and the International Writing Program hope begins to welcome visitors from abroad and we begin to travel again. I know that some of the lessons we've learned artistically speaking in TikTok, on Twitter, in, in Zoom uh, will be part of our kit bags as we go forward. Thank you. That's it. so lovely. I'm, I'm really speechless. Um, I'm hoping that the three of you um, have things that you want to pick up on from the observations that each of you have made. Um, and and I, I, I'm also just want to say kind of full circle how interesting that, you know, Melinda, you talked about grief and then, you know, Christopher, you've shared some of your own personal grief with all of us and the way that the arts and humanities play a role in that. I think there is no understanding of grief without, without letters, without words. <laughs> um, and so I really appreciate that. Christopher, being able to um, contemplate the losses of my 
relatives in the Lumbee community. Lumbee, I'm a member of the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina. And um, so being able to contemplate the disproportionate impacts of COVID on, on Black, Indigenous, and other people of color is, uh, it was very sad how the dire early statistics only seem to intensify um, the longer this has gone on. And I kept sort of praying that um, it, that wouldn't come to pass, at least, you know, when in a rural area like where my family is, we didn't see a large um, infection rate until later in the year. And, um, you know, I think, anyway, I could talk about all the failures, but I think you can't really understand the experience of that being inside the grief or watching others go through grief without the, the tools of um, storytelling, of memory, of particularly the ability to put words together <laughs> and the way that words constitute tradition. I think um, I hear this over and over again, the inability to gather for funerals is something that we just, I mean, in my family, we just can't hardly get over, you know? I mean, just the idea, not only the relatives we've lost to COVID, but also to leukemia, you know, and, and heart attack and car wreck and um, things like that, suicide, you know, these are things that we cannot, we cannot mourn. We feel like we cannot mourn because we cannot gather. That's a cultural experience that I think I am having um, and my indigenous community is having. So, and, and so in sort of in place of that, I think we've, you know, we've done some more communicating and some of the opportunities are extraordinary. Chris or Ruth Ellen, did you wanna respond either to Melinda or, or anything else that um, you shared? Oh, Ruth Ellen, I think you have to go off mute. Um, I, I just got the little message to tell me to do that. Grief is a tough one and um, it's, it is strange how we haven't been able to gather to grieve. And I was just hearing someone say the other day that um, one of the, the things that they appreciated about what happened this month with the inauguration was the public grieving for uh, victims um, of, of COVID. And I have just a few people who are adjacent to me in some way that I know um, who've lost someone, but many, many, many of the people within these digital communities are sh actively sharing their grief, which in this particular year, when we strangely found ourselves fighting the mythos of um, generated by conspiracy theorists was actually really important because as you all know, for months and months and months, we, we kept hearing this pushback about how COVID-19 was a hoax. And so um, that's another way that I witnessed a certain kind of grassroots lobbying between victims, family members, and, and healthcare workers who were very, very active and literally showing the battle wounds of having three masks on as tight as possible to dispel um, these myths, you know, for our greater good. I also think it's really strange how we, we witnessed some of the most beautiful video of the earth this year, right? So as we're collectively grieving, the earth is celebrating our absence. The sea turtles came out in droves and nested um, everywhere. They, they saw je jellyfish in some of the canals in Italy because the water was so clear you could see through it. So there is a strange way that we had this hyper sense of gathering because now we're all in the same space on a screen and yet this pervasive absence that uh, while it didn't help our money systems, 
helped our ecosystems. That's really interesting because it, 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 when you said that, uh, Ruthella and I thought um, I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia back in the early 90s. And one of the byproducts of that war was that for the first time in about a century, the rivers and streams started running clean because uh, all the factories had been shut down and that became a, a, a source of a, a certain kind of wonder. I also thinking in, in terms of the, the public uh, grieving, uh, we all remember that moment uh, by the Lincoln Memorial and that called to mind uh, my, Teresa and I have an amazing colleague in the English department named uh, Ed Folsom, who's really one of the great thinkers and scholars of Walt Whitman. And he talked about the moment in when he was a kid, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated and he went into the, his English class and the English teacher came in and didn't say anything, just read Whitman's uh, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom. And he's talking about, it, it's the poem, the great poem of, about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, Ed makes the point in this uh, lecture that he gave about that, that uh, uh, he didn't really understand the poem. He was, I think, only about 13 at the time. But the, the music, the imagery, the ways in which the English teacher was presenting that poem made grief available to him and it made it present for him. And I think that in many of the uh, things that we saw around the inauguration, particularly that night at the Lincoln Memorial, was that we finally saw the political class figuring out ways to help us grieve publicly. And that, that does mark a, a significant turn. Any more common threads that we'd like to pull on before we turn to the question and answers? I guess for me, thinking about that question of leadership has been also just a real point of reflection in 2020. Um, you know, I'm as a historian, I'm like very alert to the ways in which leaders shape our public discourse. Um, and of, of course, the attack, well, the particular attack on, on um, critical race theory and, and critical ethnic studies that came out in 2020 from leadership at the same time uh, when other other leaders who might have otherwise come to the defense of of these you know kind of critical analyses uh, were silent at least on on our campus and and many other academic circles um, people were silent reminds me of um, well it just puts it puts a warning in front of me I suppose about complacency in leadership so that I was also relieved gratified like <laughs> all of the things to see a, not, a public acknowledgement from the elite of our collective loss. And it, you know, really feeling like this, this is the first time that um, I have, you know, that first time in 2020, it, it felt something to be part of America. I think it felt something, I felt something to be part of America that was not, um, worried or resentful or, you know, in other ways, um, separate culturally, culturally part of America. I feel lots of parts of America in other ways, but in particular, culturally in the way that leadership defines culture. Um, so also seeing, you know, the most sort of racially and intersectionally diverse cabinet in US history is something that brings forth qualities of leadership that I think set a tone for us as a country culturally that will matter hopefully for many, many decades to come. Um, so yeah, being able to talk about, um, being able to see January 6th and then think about where that took place um, in the U.S. Capitol, that was another kind of cultural moment um, that I, I really will never forget. You, you know, Melinda, as you were saying that, I was thinking that 
what I have thought about constantly since the insurrection on the 6th uh, was something that a couple of journalists said in, a Serbian journalist said in the early 1990s, he was one of the very few uh, independent minded souls during that period. He was connected to Radio B92 and he was asked by somebody, how, how is it possible that this, this country, Yugoslavia, with all these different people, and got, they got along for so, for so long, and then now they're all at each other's throats. And he said, he said, you know, if all you heard on your media for five years was David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan, you too would have blood running in the streets. And I, that, that thing came back to me. The minute I saw the insurrectionists enter the Capitol, I thought, oh my God, after Fox News, after Roger Ailes, after a completely divisive presidency intended to pit one people against uh, one another, of course blood was gonna run in the streets and that's what we will be dealing with for, I suspect the rest of American history. Well, I, I think this is a good pivot to actually one of the common questions that we came up with ahead of time. Um, and so I'm just gonna read it out loud for everyone. While issues of racism and white supremacy did not start nor end in 2020, nor unfortunately I think will it end in 2021, the national and international Black Lives Matter movements seem to have propelled these issues to the front of our national consciousness. Universities have been responding in different ways to address racial justice. What responses do you think are most effective and which aren't adequate to the moment? Um, and I wanna pause here in the middle of this question to just note that in addition to being scholars, artists, and humanists, all three of our panelists also wear administrative hats on their respective campuses. Um, and so the end of that question is, again, in your experience, right, as artists, scholars, humanists, administrators, what role can the arts and humanities play in racial justice on or off campus? Well, I have to start, I have to approach this, this question by just telling you a little something about me that perhaps a lot of people don't know, that as a, as a Black woman, I'm a biracial woman, um, and I'm a biracial woman who was raised in um, underclass white communities in the Northeast of Pennsylvania, and in particular, in one of President Trump's favorite haunts this year, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, which most people had never heard of before, um, but he liked to go there. I don't know where he must have stayed. There's not a really nice hotel or anything like that. But anyway, this is the, um, this is the, the general constituent that propelled this individual to where he was. And on this side of the aisle, as I'm navigating with my uh, friends who are middle class, who are educated, you know, I think back to Hillary using the unfortunate term deplorables. And while we have a certain contingency that we saw active and mobile um, on the 6th, that's not the typical constituent supporter of the 70 million people that voted for him. Um, that town is made up of the children and grandchildren and great grandchildren of coal miners and railroad workers. Um, and the entire area is really exemplary of the evolution of American whiteness. Beginning in colonial times as we were um, obliterating and wiping out indigenous people uh, to settle there as a colony um, through the Industrial Revolution with Germans and Irish coming and not being seen as white people to the French and English, eventually assimilating and then the next wave of European immigrants at the beginning of the 20th century coming from Eastern Europe, the Poles and the Slovaks are then also not, this is an age of eugenics, not white, right? So my black body has always been suspect in that context. Um, and for that reason, I am a poet. <laughs> for that reason, I am a teacher. 
Um, and for that reason, I'm constantly learning. So what I was able to see this year was the way that those communities uh, were troubled because there was a, a message being delivered that named their enemy. And their enemy was anyone who had opportunity um, and privilege above their station, the elite. And the GOP was really able to mobilize that message. Even though Trump is a millionaire, he became like, you know, your wisecracking uncle at the end of the bar who says ridiculous things like, oh, we should just burn the whole thing down. We should just build a wall. But all of a sudden he became their savior because they were otherwise dismissed and invisible. I knew Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 election when I saw her at a podium um, in Scranton and she used the word oligarchy, the Russian oligarchy. And I thought, who does she think she's talking to? Everyone in that audience just rolled their eyes and said, she thinks she's better than us, right? And it's, it's frankly our job in the arts and humanities to embrace these communities and to, to not, uh, and I think that this is one of our, one of our sins, to, to not separate ourselves from community and to not become too comfortable in the ivory tower because our people are there as well. Um, and so I think we have great affect. If we didn't, I wouldn't be here. Um, I, I'm a product of all of those great social programs that Jimmy Carter launched in the 70s, brought photography classes to the housing project. Who knew? So that's what I think is most important right now is that we, um, we recognize that we are greater than our campus and we act that way. Melinda or Chris? I, um, I, this may not be a response to the question so much, but it's more a response to what Ruthann <laughs> just said about community, which I think is so powerful because um, we have this idea in the academy that community is like out there and we are in here. We're reinforcing that kind of ivory tower structure and binary which really doesn't do anyone any good um because as we are all members of communities ourselves we wouldn't be human if we weren't members of communities um we are community is not other community is is us and so the um again the 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 way that our um i think the way universities academic settings can can wrestle with um divisions over racial equality and i think we do have to name some things you know one of them is like what exactly people are disagreeing about and it seems that people are disagreeing about whether some americans are equal to other americans um they not everybody has like the finest point argument on that but i do think that that is one of the things that we are we must understand we are disagreeing about so if we are disagreeing about that, um, and that's a, apart from whether somebody's a racist or not, like it's, you know, <laughs> I'm not calling anybody a racist or I'm calling all of us racists. I think, I, I mean, I am perfectly comfortable saying we are all racists. We are all coming to coming to our society from a racist lens. Um, but, you know, I don't think we agree. If we can agree that we're all racist, I don't think we agree on whether everybody deserves racial equality. So um, once we name that disagreement, it is then worth, worth it to understand how our community member, who our community members are and how our community members are benefiting from that disagreement or from their stance, their opinion on that question um, and how they may not be benefiting from their opinion on that question. So I think we um so there's a layer of the debate that also needs to recognize the privilege to enter that conversation and how some of us are 
always in that conversation where we, whether we choose to be or not. And so one of the things I would, I would hope for, especially as, as arts and humanities scholars begin to think about this moment in the future around racial equality is that we will encourage folks, we will put, well, let me put, say it this way, we will put, put ourselves in and with communities, not as separate brains, you know, <laughs> operating independently somehow, but within in communities, we will place ourselves in, in dialogue that helps us name what we're actually disagreeing on and helps us properly identify our position related to that disagreement. Um, and I think so, you know, the ethics, the ethics that philosophy, you know, is, are so good at, at um, confronting us with all the time, you know, means that we don't have easy choices in that, in that context. It's very easy to say, yes, I agree with you and no, I disagree with you and I hate people I disagree with. Um, or I don't want to talk to people I disagree with, or I'm afraid to talk to people I disagree with. That's not an ethical question. You know, the ethical question is, um, what is my responsibility to people that I disagree with? I don't even have to talk to them <laughs> to have a sincere thought process and engagement with members of my community about what my responsibility is to people I disagree with. And that's a, I think that's a question that humanities can help us deal with. And it's, I sound like the, your classic scholar and saying, we're asking the wrong question. But, you know, I think sometimes universities are asking the wrong question. It's not, it is, you know, it's how you help community, how you, but Ruth Ellen, what you said is like, we are in, we are a community, we're in a community, we need to, you know, continue to to not just serve that community, but really belong and say like, as a member, we have responsibilities to others and then others have responsibilities to us, whatever us is, us starts to just break apart. I think for me anyway, when I, when I start to go down that, that train of thought. So thank you for, yeah, putting that, putting it that way. I, I, I might take a, 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 a another swing at this question from from both a literary and an administrative point of view and uh i'm going to go back to whitman there's if in in his journals there's this remarkable moment um before he writes song of myself and he's starting to figure out what it is he wants to write he's he, he knows he's got it's something in him it's a novel it might be a play maybe it's a poem and he writes this line i am the uh, poet of slaves and of the masters of slaves. I am the poet of the body. And then he kind of breaks off and he starts again. I'm the poet of the body and of the soul. I'm the poet of slaves and of the masters of slaves. And what he's after is to try to create uh, the largest, most inclusive understanding of what it means to be a, a, a citizen in a democracy. It's a kind of democratic self he's trying to create. And that means he's going to become a vessel for all kinds of voices, not just the voices that one might hear in a seminar room, but voices uh, such as uh, what Ruth Ellen was just telling us about in Wilkes-Barre. And uh, that, that can go for every part of this, this country. The administrative way I wanna think about this is that uh, we have at the University of Iowa uh, an arts advancement committee where we've been trying to figure out different ways to uh, bring different artists from different disciplines into different kinds of uh, communities and conversations. And in the spring, uh, when the pandemic was really getting going, uh, the, the chair of the committee, Alan McVeigh, and I uh, were invited by uh, the president. To, he had just come from a meeting with a lot of stakeholders in Iowa City, and he, he said there was a palpable sense of fear in the air. And these were people, these were mayors, these were city planners, these were people from uh, nonprofits, all kinds of different things. And, and so he said, could we see if we could get into a meeting with uh, with these stakeholders and see what what we might do vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic so we had one very productive meeting and we were getting ready to have a second productive meeting and george floyd was murdered 
and everything changed. And uh, I remember we went into that next meeting and the pandemic was in on everybody's mind, but Black Lives Matters was also on everybody's mind. And what happened over the next several weeks, we, we, we yes, we were still concerned with the pandemic as we will be for the, the, the next year or so perhaps. And we were trying to figure out ways to work with that, but our energy just went in another direction and thought, so what can we do? And just one example, because we'll be premiering this work uh, next month uh, on our jazz faculty is a fantastic, uh, uh, in our music department, a fantastic jazz musician and composer, Damani Phillips. And uh, we started a conversation with him and said, you know, if we could find some money, uh, how might you, could you put together, could we commission a work that would in some way or another address what's going on around us? And he came up with this uh, incredible project called Facing Truth, Facing, uh, Facing Self, Facing Truth, where he's taking images, you might call the iconography of the last 30 years, uh, starting with the Rodney King riots uh, up until George Floyd, does he think, okay, I'm gonna take six, seven iconic moments and he himself will write some music and some of his students will write music to that. We'll have about an hour long uh, series of music, dance, uh, images, uh, a performance in mid-February. And I thought, now that's, that's th the best part of a university is you've got all these incredibly talented people in different departments. And if you can just figure out a way to tap into that, you might make something new that will not just unsettle us in an artistic way, but uh, provide ways to think about our, our next steps into the future. So that's the literary and the administrative part of my, my thinking. Thank you. We have a lot of questions coming into the um, to the Q&A section, so I'm just going to sort of try and collapse a few of them. Um, some, a lot of people are writing in asking a kind of variation on what is the role of arts and humanities, um, particularly public arts and humanities or arts and humanities done at the university level, in trying to address the political divisiveness that we've seen come out of 2020. And, and I guess I should say, um, from some of these, from some of the questions, I think it's from the past four years of this particular White House administration, um, as well as a very contentious uh, elec election um, that uh, the former president did not concede to this day, um, as well as the January 6th insurrection. Um, and so, you know, is there, um, is there an, a responsibility maybe that we have as artists and humanists and scholars to try and bridge that political divide or is there, um, a need for some accountability maybe before we can hope to try and come to some kind of reconciliation. I just wanna mention the idea of atonement for a second. Like atonement, apology um, is a step to being able to recognize one's participation in a community. And I think all kinds of things about humanities, text, I mean, the three of us think about texts a lot and there's films, I'm also a filmmaker, like there's all sorts of ways to engage stories of atonement. Um, there are religious rituals of atonement that people identify deeply. And so I think uh, one of the things that, that everyone does is that they they tap into the parts of their cultures and their communities and their societies that instruct us as to how to behave in a particular moment. And uh, so the human it's to me it's not so much what do we as humanity scholars should do except just point us to the source material that is there for all of us to access and think through and embrace or reject. Um, there are so many foundational texts that matter to people on all sort of sides of this debate, not to mention the very land that we live on. You know, um, when Jennifer Lopez saying this land is your land at the inauguration, a lot of indigenous people were like, nope, <laughs> you know, you can talk all you want to about 
Pete Seeger wrote that as a radical thing and it was a critique. No, I don't care, right? It's only your land because somebody stole it from us. Well, that's one interpretation, but I actually think that when people talk about land back as a movement, as a sovereignty movement, they are also saying we can live together on this land under the stewardship and uh, intellectual, you know, stewardship of the people who originally lived here and still do live here. And that's an ethical commitment that is similar to a text that we share, whether it's Whitman or it's the Constitution or it's Frederick Douglass or there are, you know, Ruth Ellen Coker and Christopher Merrill. These are all texts that we share. And so when we think of the land in that way too, there are, there's knowledge that needs to be respected. And there is, there's permission that needs to be asked to be in that place and to be in, in proper community with people who are stewarding those places. Um, so I think what we as scholars can do is actually just to sort of say here, America, <laughs> wherever you might be here students, you know, wherever you might be on a political spectrum, this is a, there are many things that we share and find something that you share we can help people, I think, find something and teach people to analyze texts that, that we share um, without necessarily imposing value judgments like this is a better text than another text or this is a more important text than another text. Maybe, I mean, yes, maybe we can have a discussion about something that's more important than another, than something else, but that is itself a kind of interesting and important classroom activity that people don't necessarily need to do if they're on different sides of a debate, you know but they can look to Whitman. And I do think that Whitman's intention was to find in his voice some room for every, everybody that lived in, in within the bounds of the democracy that he imagined at that time, you know, uh, to belong. And so, you know, Whitman is one of our American Bibles and maybe there are Bible being a metaphor, you know, for a foundational instructive text and I, you know, I would love to, these websites exist. I mean, but I would love to see people who are locked in disagreement, find a text that they all draw something from and say, why do we draw something from this? And so I think all his, I think what scholars need to do maybe is just sometimes point to these texts just as, as people have done today. And, and part of the texts in my life are, are as our, public art landscape, for example, or monument landscape. So looking at the, the image of freedom that rests on top of the Capitol uh, in Washington, DC, it's in the configuration of an indigenous woman. She has a bird with a fantastic you know, spray of feathers on her helmet. She's carrying the sword of Athena. And the sword is down by her side. So she's not like brandishing it. Like she must, you know, she's on the attack, right? Or nor is she on the defense. I mean, she is, it's simply guard, the sword is there to guard her and to guard the people that she is protecting. So that image of freedom, it's plaster cast was put together by an enslaved individual in Washington DC in 1861 in the middle of the civil war. Um, and I just, think about the person who created that statue. I think about the ways in which indigenous women's bodies have been appropriated, um, exploited and otherwise abused in this society, but that treatment doesn't take away their power. If anything, it signals that they, they are a, remain a deep threat to the folks who are exploiting and abusing and murdering them. Um, but the symbolic figure of that indigenous woman Whose, whose cast of the original bronze was fashioned by an enslaved man is something that it's a common image. It's a common image that doesn't just belong to everybody in the sense that you can take it and you can do what you want to with it. You don't own it, <laughs> but it is something that we all, you know, everyone who lives under the jurisdiction of the US constitution which is, you know, citizens and non-citizens, um, if you're going to get to the 14th and 15th amendments, you know, these are, those are people in communities 
who can referen reference that work, that statue and its history as a way to understand ethically where do we need to be in society? Who, do we, who are we responsible for? Who do we apologize to? Um, what do we need to do just to take the next step forward? Um, I'll just. Oh, Ruth Ellen, I think you accidentally muted yourself. I'm muted. So I'm, I'm muted. I'm sorry. Um, I completely agree with that. And as far as next steps forward, you know, I have to go back to this notion that in the arts and humanities, I think that we um, can do our best job if we avail ourselves to the largest community possible. I think that this uh, particular format and the webinar is exemplary of the way uh, the arts and humanities can reach people outside of the silo of a campus. And it's more necessary than ever. And that was exemplified you know, in the last year when we saw um, so much actual activity, um, uh, whether it was activism or an insurrection, that was fueled by misinformation, a lack of knowledge of facts, of even basic history. You know, I, I, I think this year I've finally come to believe that in the same way that trickle down economics has failed, trickle down education has failed. Um, and it's, it's really not getting to our, our common man. Um, I learned on TikTok, <laughs> I didn't know this, there's actually a hashtag I learned on TikTok. I learned on TikTok that in, um, that in American high schools, um, different high schools in different areas in different states can use the exact same text edition volume, but there will be different information. Right, so that in a in a classroom in Tennessee, for example, a history book may talk about the Confederate flag from the point of view and the lens of um, a marker of heritage and tradition, specifically, and that in another state it may um, represent um, the abolition of slavery with the fall of the Confederacy. Uh, and some of the facts are not even that nuanced in the way that they might come to oppose one another. So if, if, we're, if we're not reaching out in the way that we're reaching out here today to have these conversations um, and to actually l let knowledge trickle down, it's no wonder we have a country that is split a little too closely down the middle in terms of their ideological position. And you know, sometimes you, you look at what's happening in this country and you think, how are we all living in the same country? And yet we can be so opposed. Well, there are seeds of opposition that are planted um, in very specific ways that we actually have the agency um, to either nurture or suppress, depending on how well they serve unity and community. So I, I, I have, I've come to believe that I have a greater community mission now from this point forward. Thank you. Chris, do you, I don't know if you wanna to add to anything or I can jump to more of the wonderful questions we have. I think I'll just jump in and say that, uh, as you were saying that, Ruth Ellen, I, I thought of uh, a late friend who I knew from the war in the former Yugoslavia. He had been a librarian in Sarajevo, and he was one of the people responsible for saving the, the priceless uh, Sarajevo Haggadah. And I was with him at a conference after the war ended in Barcelona. and. Uh, he, he himself was a product of a mixed marriage, and his wife was the product of a mixed marriage, and the National Library had been burned down. So what did he do during the war? He set up his own little neighborhood lending library, 
And he, he said to me, the only competition that counts is the competition of cuisines. He didn't want to hear any of the, the, the different histories of how uh, Bosnia and Serbs and Croats got into this, into this uh, internecine war. And then he said, uh, he said, but the thing we also have to remember is that this war is going to come to an end and uh, we're going to have to live with all of these people uh, after the war in some fashion. So uh, it would be a good idea for us to act well and generously. And I've always thought that was a, a way to think about some of these, these issues, to act well and generously. Those are really good words for us to remember and live by in general, Chris, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna um, take moderator's privilege by calling on a question from a friend of mine who's in Chapel Hill and that's uh, Lloyd Kramer, so hello to Lloyd. Um, and I also wanted to take this question because it really gets into a very specific art piece um, that's connected to the inauguration. Um, so Lloyd asks, how do you think Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, connected poetic insights to the current political crisis of democracy? Does poetry lead to new political understanding. Um, and I actually wanted to also take sort of moderator's prerogative by specifically asking Ruth Ellen and Chris, I don't know if you've been seeing some controversy over um, aesthetics related to Gorman's poem. So I've been seeing that um, there's kind of an active debate on social media about the um, poetic value, whether, whether Gorman has written a good poem. And there are people who are saying like, you know, criticizing it going, you know, doing this kind of, you know, literary analysis of it. And um, there are poets themselves who are saying, this is a terrible poem. Like, I can't believe, like basically insinuating the only reason that she was asked to deliver the poem is because she's a young black woman. And then of course there's people who are then jumping on those critics and saying, you're being racist. And then there are, are poets of color, right? Black poets are saying, no, I'm a black poet and I actually think this is a terrible poem and here's why. And so I, you know, I don't know if, if either of you as poets want to speak to that, but that was actually something that I thought was a curious unfolding that I've been seeing. Um, but but Lord, Lloyd's question really is, and you can, you can read it in the Q&A, is really about you know, poetry connected to politics. Well, I'll jump in to say first, Amanda Gorman is a, uh, the youth poet laureate, which is very specific. She's 22. I uh, run poetry workshops with 22 year olds. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm okay with it. As, as we move through our careers, we hone our craft and there are multiple genres of poetry. And Amanda Gorman comes out of very specific um, community of, you know, basically spoken word poetry, which has a different aesthetic, which has a, a different mission. Um, fun fact, Amanda Gorman's hashtag has 5.9 million views on TikTok. Uh, and I'll say this, as a career poet, I adore uh, Joy Harho and she is our US poet laureate. So while I appreciate seeing Amanda and the former US poet laureate, Elizabeth Alexander, even though she is a career poet, was also criticized for the same thing um, for the poem that she read during Obama's uh, inauguration. And, and, and she was you know, in her 50s. And people are saying that really wasn't a good poem. Part of it, Chris, I think you can attest to the fact that we love Duende and we love darkness and the inauguration is not really an occasion for darkness. It's an occasion for joy. And the hardest poems to write are poems about joy. Um, but I went online because uh, someone had called Amanda the US Poet Laureate. So I made the mistake of just simply offering a correction and saying, oh, she's actually the Youth Poet Laureate and uh, Joy Harho is the US Poet Laureate. I was crucified. Um, people were writing in all caps, Amanda Gorman is my president, okay? So does it have to be a good poem to have impact? I'm thinking not, I think it doesn't matter. I think that in some cases the, the message and the occasion matter most. And ultimately, you know, as you're talking about Barcelona, Chris, I'm, I'm thinking of Lorca, yeah. right? Um, 
who was a poet who was assassinated by the dictator Franco because as you know as we've learned from Greek rhetoric poets are dangerous because they can sway the heart of the people Amanda Gorman swayed the heart of the people and ultimately that's what matters it may not get her published in poetry magazine but it's gotten her 5.9 million <laughs> fans who were ready to beat me to a pulp and tar and feather me because I corrected her title. So I think it had a great impact on this country in an age when the very specific uh, dem age demographic that she represents has had considerable affect um, in this country politically this year, perhaps, you know, more than any other. I, I love the way that you phrased that, uh, uh, phrase that Ruth Ellen. Um, and isn't it kind of wonderful that people are up in arms about poetry? Uh, I, I, I seem to recall not just Elizabeth Alexander, but uh, Miller Williams uh, was castigated for his inauguration poem. It's an impossible form to work in. But the way I'm, I'm thinking about that is, uh, I'll quote my late friend Marvin Bell, he, he has an essay and he, he's talking about what goes on in the, in the world of poetry. And he, he, he remembers the story of Allen Ginsberg walking across the campus and for all I know, it was uh, at, at Chapel Hill or in, in, uh, in Boulder. And somebody calls out to him, uh, have you read Bob Creeley's new book? And he, 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 the guy said it in such a way that he didn't like the book. And he wanted Allen Ginsberg to ratify that for him. And Allen said, I haven't read it, but whatever Bob is doing, I'm all for it. And I mean, look, we had poetry again in, a, uh, in an inauguration. Last time it was Kid Rock. I think that's we've we've gone we've gotten a lot better. And I will say as well as you said, Chris, people are getting up in arms about poetry again. Um, and again, my um, social media experience was that uh, we are still outlaws in the way that I said. You know, <laughs> Evie Shockley said, especially all black poets are renegade. Right. And, and I believe all black poets are renegade because the black body is always suspect. Right. The black and brown, the black and brown body is always suspect. And one of the few community violations that I received from a post was reading a few lines of Lorca's poetry. Uh, violated community guidelines. Um, and I read a few lines from the poem, Casita of the Boy Wounded by Water. Yeah. Um, I want to go down to the well. I want to die my own death by mouthfuls. I want to stuff my heart with moss. Yeah. It was a dangerous post and it was taken down. Oh so somebody's listening to poetry and somebody else is wor still, still worried about poetry. And I think that says something big too. Mm -hmm. Censorship is always uh, smoke. <laughs> there's fire where there's smoke, right? Yeah. And I saw today that uh, the Poetry Foundation daily poem was Garcia Lorca. So uh, at least we can get it by in our email if we like. Melinda, I'm wondering if you want to respond either to the Gorman um, poem question or, or with your filmmaker hat on in terms of the role well, of the arts. I wish I was a poet. I when, when I was that was like the my first thing I wanted to be was a poet. It didn't happen, but <laughs> I'm super excited to be talking to two poets. Um, I was also sort of always thought that poetry was like wine. Like it's good if you like it, you know. It, it's if you don't like it, it's not good. And everybody should have be entitled to have their their favorites. Uh, we sort we can't get favorite poets if we don't see poets. Um, and the more poets that look like us or that belong in our communities or that think about, you know, think about the world the way that we do, the more poetry we're going to get to love and learn from and, and appreciate. Um, I think in particular, when I heard her poem, it, it really reminded me of, well, it took me a minute. It wasn't like this was the instant. I'm not this much of a nerd. It's not like this was like the instant like recollection. 
took a minute for me to remember that poetry as a genre has changed so much because of music. And while I feel like I heard spoken word in her form, I also heard a lot of beats. I heard a lot of hip hop in her form. I heard a lot of things that like I love listening to. Um, and so for that reason, it, it took me then another minute to think about how film as a genre has changed um, and changes constantly because of music. So being able to imagine the way a story is told on film, it's no longer its thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? It's not always this conflict driven narrative that has to be resolved in some way or a hero has to win. And even as recently as, you know, 20 years ago, much of what you saw in documentary was exactly that. There was some conflict driven story that had a narrator to explain it all to you. You couldn't see anything or digest anything on your own. Somebody was constantly talking to you, explaining it. And you were supposed to feel a certain way about the journey that was being portrayed. Um, now, I think because of music and because also the way that other performance forms have, have evolved, like stand-up comedy, for example, um, you know, the innovations in spoken word and in theater has really helped to change film um, because we can now sit back. This is the weekend of the Sundance Film Festival. Yay. You know, you can go get a single ticket for $15 um, on their website. So, so go and find, watch it on their website. <laughs> you can watch dozens of films. Um, you know, the, being able to say like, we can now hear stories that are beyond that like narrow construction of, of life or a journey. We can see transformation in lots of different ways. I think that's a lot of, that's largely because music and performance have done the work uh, for storytellers. And so I just, anyway, that's kind of what I brought, was brought to my mind as I showed the daughter, showed the poem to my daughter and who's 13 and, she was just like, yes, you know, I want to be her. Um, so. I'm glad you mentioned stand-ups because I'm always saying to students, you can, uh, writing, you can learn a lot about your craft from watching a good stand-up work. Uh, and the other thought I had about that, just to go back to the arguments over the quality or how we might want to think about Amanda's poem, uh, our new Nobel laureate and former poet laureate Louise Glick uh, in an essay long ago talked about the importance of what she called corrective reading. And that is to say that she gets, you know, we get used to reading a certain kind of poem and then that will generate our own poems often in that kind of vein. And then she, she realized how important it was to read across or against the grain of what she liked to do. So. Uh, that's just another thought to keep in mind. And that really that's about what the, the humanities offer us are different ways to do corrective reading. You know, Gluck, uh, Louise Gluck also talks about um, the, what she calls the uh, parade of trauma um, that some kind, sometimes becomes a common trope in contemporary poetry. And she sees it as a, a problem. And that's what's interesting about Amanda Gorman in that uh, she's, she's of a very specific genre of aspirational uh, poetry. Um, Maya Angelou might be the most, the, the the most well-known poet uh, among um, all walks of life in America who isn't taught a lot in academia for that reason that her poetry isn't considered complicated um, or it doesn't have depth or the, the quality because it's of this, this particular genre. I think Amanda Gorman might have, you know, um, revived the genre of aspirational poetry. And I think that we can look around and see other genres. I think the genre of satire was revived this year too. Um, satire as humor, but also as a kind of uh, activism or 
um, political rhetoric, you know, in the tradition of Pope. And uh, I think, again, it's the way that I see the arts and humanities all around me um, as really um, active um, uh, uh, disciplines in, pr in practice, uh, not just as subject. There are way too many questions that we have on deck and that we didn't even get to. Um, and I'm really looking at time. Um, I'm going to attempt uh, a, a question that I think may thread some of the um, things that people in the Q&A have been um, asking related to higher ed, since all, you know, all of us work in higher education, um, as well as being humanists, um, and in your case, as artists um, and scholars. So. Um, what do you see as the challenges sort of, again, moving ahead? So thinking about the challenges of 2020, thinking about what 2021 may have in store for us. Um, you know, one of the questioners asked, you know, particularly the kind of failures of universities to address issues like racial justice, like, um, like COVID-19 um, in terms of providing an in-person education, which may or may not, I, I will interject and say, may or may not be fair, right, in terms of, you know, depending on the circumstance, because everything is localized. Um, what do you see on the horizon for higher education and for publishing? Um, because again, I've been hearing a lot about um, publishing venues that may be closing up. Certainly, um, I've been hearing at see Boulder's campus from faculty artists who are very concerned that there are galleries that are closing and they're not sure if those galleries are going to open back up. And so if you have galleries and theaters closing, you have fewer venues for artists to perform and exhibit their works, um, which is going to definitely have ramifications in higher education. Um, and so I just would be curious about all of your thoughts on that. I, I, I had a, quite a few budget meetings. What day is it, Wednesday? I have a, at least one or two uh, or three a week uh, yesterday, we had the a budget meeting, as you know, Jennifer, where the dean speaks to all the chairs and directors in the college. Um, today, two meetings where the dean is talking to the dean's team. We're talking about the cuts that we've had to make. Um, our campus has made just under 5%. Um, uh, I shouldn't say campus. I should say College of Arts and Sciences. Um, under 5%, but it's a significant amount of uh, cutting to a $150 million budget, you know, 40% of which is salary. So uh, funding, I know that we, that we don't like that word. It's like beating a dead horse, but it's imperative. Sometimes we have to make really tough decisions and um, those decisions cannot always be at the expense of the arts and humanities unless we want to see that dissident population that attack the capital on the sixth grow exponentially. We have to be um, present. Uh, humanity has to be present uh, in society in community and in education. So I, that's my biggest concern right now that we can't really do what we do and perpetuate what we do without finding ways to fund. Melinda or Chris? Um, I'm gonna take us back in time to a what is not a settled period and how historians talk about it, but I think it feels pretty settled in American history, which is, the New Deal and FDR's response to the New Deal. We, one of the things that Americans, um, many of them who are now, you know, much older, many of whom have passed away at this point, remember from that time period is the revitalization of infrastructure, not just roads and bridges and, and streetlights and electricity in rural areas, those are all critical, critical things um, to, to maintain people's quality of life, but also a, a arts infrastructure, um, a certain kind of, you know, there's, there was a federal writers project. 
there was there were photographers employed there were all kinds of folks um that were able to not just earn a living but also contribute substantively um to what we know about our ourselves our lives our our country um in real time because uh the society because there was political will to solve that the problem of the great depression in a variety of ways and to because there was um a, you know the the political will determined that these things were of value and that rural electrification you know was going to transform the country the interstate system which didn't exactly emerge in the new deal but came after that you know was going to transform the country and that a widespread commitment to the arts was also going to transform the country and i think in many respects it worked right there was a there was a retrenchment as we always see <laughs> in american society we we see advances in how the arts and humanities are valued and then we see cutbacks you know, we see advances and then we see cutbacks. Um, and that, you know, that maybe represents a, a larger kind of lack of political will to commit to the things that we know we need to maintain our, our coherent sense of society and a national identity. Um, but, you know, I do feel optimistic that, um, that, leadership going back you know we started at the very beginning of this call you know conversation thinking about what leaders should do and how they set the tone um i think leaders can provide you know just as important um value and allocation of resources that you know arts and humanities are remarkably cheap things to do it's it's really expensive when you lose them right you see insurrections and other things when you lose them, but they're pretty cheap to keep. And they're not that expensive to grow. They're not that expensive to invest in compared to many other disciplines um, in our higher ed settings. So I hope that that kind of, cal we can appeal to that type of calculation, Ruth Ellen, as you have to make these incredibly difficult decisions with your colleagues you know, that there are narratives from, from storytelling and there are narratives of change and narratives of impact, both past and present that help us see that other people have wrestled with this and they have come to a particular conclusion and that conclusion has had consequences, many of them positive. Some of them have been negative, but many of the consequences of the New Deal were also positive. Um, you, the New Deal brought us, uh, let us now praise famous men, one of the great books, of, not just of nonfiction reportage, but of photographs. And at the University of Iowa next, uh, in about a year, we'll open uh, a new art museum, which was our old art museum was destroyed in a flood in 2008. And the centerpiece of that is Jackson Pollock's mural and of course, Meryl uh, Pollock stayed alive during the Great Depression because he was working as one of the one of the artists in the WPA. He was more of a figurative artist at that point, but because he was able to to, to keep at it, uh, eventually he made the, the breakthrough abstract expressionist paintings that we know and love. And uh, I. And I was also thinking the other great painting we have in our collection, we have a lot of great works, but we have one of Robert Motherwell's uh, paintings, uh, The Elegies of the Spanish Revolution, which is uh, so much about Garcia Lorca. And so I, I every, there are many nights that I think, oh, I can't wait to see Mural again and the Motherwell. And I mean, that's, that's how we retain our humanity. That's what the arts and the humanities give us, ways to be present to ourselves. Thank you all. We are really nearing time. And so I just, you know, if you're at home for the viewers who are still with us, I just want you to all give a round of applause or for our wonderful, wonderful panelists. Um, I feel like I could, I still have so many more questions. I'd love us to try and get through, but um, we have dinner and lives and things to get to. So just thank you so much. Um, and now I, I turn to Teresa. Um, come back on screen, Teresa, uh, my dear friend in Iowa. 
I am trying to come back and I can't quite, can you all hear me? So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to reappear for some mysterious reason, but I am delighted to be part of this wonderful event. I want to thank Jennifer Ho and, um, and uh, Max Orr uh, and to say how much it's meant for all of us to work together. And I especially want to thank our panelists for a thought provoking conversation that will have me pondering for many days to come the way that the arts and humanities can move forward in 2021 to what we all hope will be a bright new day. So thank you, good night to everyone, and um, let's work together to make the next year a much better year. Good night. Good night. <laughs>